Hi, and uh, welcome to the 3.30 server, or, um, presentation. My name's uh, Dave Drinkle. I, I'm a senior software engineer with Expedia. And I've been uh, with Expedia for about six years. And for the last three years, I've been working specifically on Nginx configuration um, for routing traffic through our front door. So really what I want to talk about today is just kind of walk through that, um, some of the things, tip, tips and tricks that we've kind of learned. Um, before I get going too far, I thought I'd introduce a little bit more about me because just my name isn't very interesting. So um, let's start with, I, I like to play video games and I, I play Overwatch right now. I'm a really big roller coaster fan, especially ones that have big drops like that one. I uh, drink my alcohol in buckets, so bring it. <laughs> Um, I like to play board games, and I'm enough of a geek that I will actually paint my miniatures if I, uh, if I can. So I don't do a very good job on them. But I, and then for all of you uh, people who are cat lovers, I'm sorry, I'm a dog person. So that's, uh, that's just a little bit about me. Um, not really anything to do with Nginx, I'm sorry. So um, anyway, let's go into what I want to really talk about today is really three pillars that we kind of built our cloud migration up onto. Uh, the first was is uh, multi-region resiliency. This is um, how we use Nginx to build cross-regional failover into our Nginx configurations um, so that we don't have to deal with manual. If something goes down in one region, we auto failover to the other. We'll talk about how we do that. Um, it's pretty straightforward Nginx configuration to do all of these things, but I just kind of wanted to um, bring them to light. So. Uh, the second thing I, I want to touch on is avoiding the knife edge. We really, at Expedia, we really try to focus on uh, making slow changes. So um, if we've put a new app out there in the cloud, I call, we call them apps. They're basically microservices. Um, and that app or microservice is taking, or the, the current path that we want to use, send traffic to the new microservice is taking current traffic. We want to do that in a slow, controlled manner. And we want to have a way to be able to roll that back as quickly as possible as well. And then the last thing I want to talk about is reacting to errors. Um, and these are kind of the, how, we have our, how we can set up our proxy to um, react to the errors that are coming back from our microservices or our apps. Okay? Uh, before I kind of get into this, I, my goal today is to give you guys, when you leave, a, a configuration that's actually pretty functional. I don't touch on a few things just because of time. Um, but before I really get into these three things, I wanted to kind of give us where we're, a starting point. Okay? And this is kind of what Expedia looked like for our traffic routing um, before we really went to the cloud. Uh, traffic would come in through the browser, it would hit our CDN, and then the traffic would go to onto our data centers. It's pretty straightforward. And the first step we have to do when we're trying to move to the cloud is get our Nginx cluster out there and traffic through it. So what I like to say is we like to put Nginx in there as a man in the middle, um, but we still want to route that traffic back to the data center. So this is kind of what we're going to go to, where the traffic is going to go, the CDN is going to break that traffic up routed into our multiple regions. But instead of the traffic going into our microservices, we're going to route it all the way back to the app, uh, back to the data center. Okay? So that's kind of where I want to start. Um, that gets us into our base configuration. Um, I really haven't talked too much or taken any time to give you all of the extra configuration that you're going to need. You're going to need your access logs and your error logs and you know, all your proxy pa parameters and all that kind of stuff. But this, this is basically the basic configuration for getting your, your data center set up. Um, really, we've set it up with two data centers that are, that are weighted 70-30. Uh, we've got your max fail and max ti uh, fail timeout set up, and then we've, we've tweaked the, added the resolve parameter, um, which is an Nginx on, uh, plus only feature, but that ensures that we're, our, our DNS for our data centers are getting re resolved um, based on the resolve configuration that we have. And then the server configuration down here looks pretty straightforward. There's nothing really rocket science going on here. We're going to take all of the traffic, that location block there is going to take all of the traffic. Um, that doesn't have another route defined, and we're going to route it to our data center with that proxy pass line. Uh, good practice, we always set the proxy he set headers for the host, and we always do the X forwarded for as well. So, so kind of what we have in the configuration. There's not a lot here going on. I just wanted to give you this base, base configuration that we're going to kind of build up as we go. Um, as we go in, let's talk about multi-region resiliency. Why do we need it? Um, 
for, for us, we, f we focus on these two main things, which is fault tolerance. We want to be able to be sure that our, our customers are always getting a response if we can get them the response. If that means routing traffic from one region to another, we will. Um, and then the other thing, if your microservice can be built so that it doesn't have to phone home to the data center, then you can actually get a really nice reduced re latency by having your microservices deployed to all of the re or as many regions as you can. And that just means putting Nginx in place there. Uh, for the actual resiliency pieces, we're going to use Nginx plus health checks, and it just to ensure it's auto failover. So um, I kind of feel like peop some people get things better when there's text, and some people get things better when there's pictures. So I'm going to kind of do both. So really what we're picture we have here is all our traffic is coming in from our CDN. It's going into our Nginx clusters in the regions. And it, this is our happy path, right? All of the traffic is uh, in our the Nginx cluster in region one is getting routed to the app in region one. And the Nginx cluster is routing traffic in region two. It's routing it to the app in region two. But what happens if we have a problem with that app? That app falls off the face of the planet, just starts dying, whatever. What we want, the configuration we're going to try and get to, or we'll get to, is this, where what we're going to have is it, the Nginx cluster in region one is just going to stop sending traffic to that the app in region one and route it back over to region two. Now, there's obviously some networking layer stuff here we have to make sure we have in place. You've got to make sure that you can actually talk from region one to region two. Um, you, oddly enough, we've had to run into that a, a couple times. So. Um, the configuration as we go with this, uh, we'll just have the app configuration. And it's very similar to what I just showed you at the data center, right? We have our, our app upstream. Uh, the, the, the key here is that we have one server, the primary, the top one there, uh, app one, region one. Um, it's set up with the max fails and failout timeouts and it's resolve. So it's going to take all of our traffic. And then the second server, is just a backup. We have that as backup, and that's going over to our region two. Okay, and the key there is we're going to just if if we get hard failures with our with 500s or um, that kind of thing from the from region one server, then Nginx will they'll fail over. That's what the max fails is all about. And then we're also going to set up our health checks uh, at the bottom of this config. So uh, the next section of there is the the match um, that tells Nginx what we consider to be a valid response from a health check. And for us, we don't, we're not really too concerned about the response, what's in the response. So here we're just doing, if it's got a status between 200 and 399, we consider it a, a valid response for a health check. Okay? Um, the configuration for our, our actual application, we're going to say that anything on slash my app, um, if you make a request on that, that's going to go to our application in the cloud. So that's what this proxy pass line is all about. I could be using the mouse pointer to point, you, point to where I'm talking about. Um, you'll notice here that I've actually split out the health checks. And the reason I've done this, uh, there's a couple reasons. One, uh, in, the in the next couple slides, we're going to mess with this upstream. And what I don't want to have is my health checks be tied directly to this particular location block. So the other reason we can do this is if we have multiple URL paths that we want to route to a single microservice, we can have multiple paths and multiple location blocks within our configuration, but we don't have to have the health check configuration multiple times within there. So this kind of works. We like it. Um, we just put the, the uh, health checks and then whatever the app is that we're, we're health checking, and we, we configure it that way. The reason this works, by the way, is just because when Nginx is health checking, it's health checking the upstream itself. So if you have two part location blocks that are both, use, are both using the same upstream, as long as the health check fails on one of them, it will fail on everything related to that upstream. Okay, so that's kind of why we can break it out, and it still works just fine. Uh, the health checker there is pretty straightforward. We're taking our match. We're uh, saying that we want to match on the, the criteria from is working. If it fails twice, we're going to consider it bad. If it, and it has to fail twice within an interval of, of 15 seconds. So it, or it's going to check every 15 seconds. So it has to fail twice within 30 seconds. Um, and then we, we, we want to slow that down for positive, so we have our passes take a little bit longer. And then the, just the URI. There's lots of other configuration you can do within the health check itself. But for now, and for, for just simplicity of the configuration here, I just kind of removed that. So this, well, this will get you going for sure, and you can kind of go from there.
So that's kind of really what I want to talk about when we talk about um, multi-region resiliency, right? That it's a very simple config, but it really does give us an auto failover from one region to the other. So let's kind of move on to the knife edge. The, one of the things about this configuration is you'll notice that if we just put this in here right now, every, every request for my app would immediately start going to our applications upstream. It wouldn't be split between the data center. So I want to talk about how to remove that. And again, it's a pretty simple configuration, um, but it, it's, it works. So um, let's talk about why we want to remove the knife edge. Uh, we want traffic to be moved from one origin to another in a controlled manner. Um, if we can send only 10% of traffic to a new uh, microservice and then start slowly, methodically moving that up to 100%, we're going to be much better off when you're dealing with something at scale. Right? If you're taking um, the kind of traffic that Expedia takes, uh, we're, you, you don't want to break everything for even a few seconds if you can. So you really want to try and do this as slowly as possible, uh, but you don't want to be too slow. Okay. Uh, this is kind of an obvious point, but it's specifically, it's only useful for URL patterns that are currently taking traffic. If you've got a brand new URL pattern that's going to go to a brand new microservice, this is kind of, this is, you would not use this configuration. Uh, what we're going to do for this is we're going to use two plugin or modules that come with Nginx called the user ID plugin and the split clients plugin. And we're going to kind of work, make them work together. So. Again, a little picture of what we're going to do. It's pretty obvious. Again, uh, traffic is going to come in from the CDN. It's going to hit that, that Nginx cluster, and um, the Nginx cluster is going to split that however we need to uh, back from between your app in the cloud and your data center. Okay? Uh, so let's talk about this, the, uh, the cookie first. It's pretty basic configuration. We turn on the user ID cookie. Um, we set what the name of the cookie is going to be. We set the path and the expiry. We, we set it pretty high at 365 days, but we just don't need it to change very often. So that's kind of what we did. There are a couple, um, there's one big gotcha with this guy um, that I kind of like to mention, and it's kind of important, and that is that user ID cookie is going to generate a, an ID, but it's not guaranteed unique, so it's not a GUID. It's close to a good, and it'll be fairly unique, but you will get duplicates. So if it's really important for you to have a perfect split and everybody get a unique cookie, you can't use the user ID plugin. So you'd have to come up with some other mechanism to generate a cookie prior to actually hitting the proxy or before Nginx actually starts processing the request, which could be done with Lua, um, but we're just going to talk about it from this perspective for now. So. The split client's cl uh, configuration is also really, really simple. Um, all we're doing here, it, the split clients kind of works like a map, if you've ever used maps within Nginx, where we're going to inspect the cookie underscore our bucket. And based on uh, that, that variable or that value is going to go through a, um, a hashing algorithm. It's uh, an algorithm called murmurhash2. And that just takes that that key or that value and um, generates a big number, and then from that number generates a percentage. From that, it, if you fall into the percentage, so say we're at 9%, we would go to our app upstream. If we're anything above 10, we're going to go to our data center. And what happens there is the value of app upstream or value of data center gets applied to the variable app throttle. Okay. One thing I want to there's two things I want to mention about this. Um, you cannot use variables within the value of your split client. So if, for instance, you needed to, uh, I can't even really think of an example, but there, there have been times where we've tried to use a variable and it didn't work. You can use upstreams, but you just can't use variables. They'll, the variable will get interpolated as a string and you'll get a, a string with your variable name. Okay? Uh, the other thing that I want to talk about is the cookie underscore our bucket. There's, uh, an interesting problem that we ran into where the very first time a user comes into your, hits your proxy and generates the cookie, that's where the user ID plugin is generating that cookie, um, which is perfect, it's, it works great, except that when the cookie is generated, it does not get applied to the variable cookie underscore our bucket. So the very first time a customer comes into your proxy, without the cookie and it's generated, this variable will be empty. 
Okay? And what that effectively does is your hashing algorithm hashes every one of those people exactly the same way with the exact percentage and you end up with really not a very good split. So what we came up with was a slightly different modification to this configuration and it uses two variables that are available from the user ID plugin. Um, and it's very, it's a, it's a, just a very slight change. Instead of inspecting the cookie our bucket, what we're going to do is inspect two variables. One is called UID set, and the other is called UID got. And what these two variables are, they're two mutually exclusive variables. One, either only one will ever be set at a time. And what they do is UID set will be set when the user ID plugin sets the cookie. And it'll be blank when the cookie has been sent in from the browser, and then UID got will, be of, uh, will have the same value when it has, um, the request has come in from the browser with the cookie, and it'll be blank whenever user ID plugin is actually setting it. So effectively what we've done here is we've used two variables. We know that one of them is always going to be blank, so we end up getting the same result. Um, from both of them. And what this does is for your very first request that comes in to your proxy for your users, you're always going to get a good split. Okay? Um, the last bit of this configuration is really simple. I mentioned earlier that we were going to tweak the, we are going to play around with that, um, the upstream within our app location block. And this is exactly what we're just, we're just all we're going to do is in change, instead of changing using app upstream, we're going to use app underscore throttle which is what we set with that split client config, right? Right here, okay? Really straightforward, but what we end up getting is a, a nice split that we can control with, with our code just by switching the percentages. Um, there is actually one other thing I wanted to mention about split clients that I actually forgot about, which is that zero is not a valid option. So you cannot put a zero as a percentage. So if you do have to um, take your percentage back down to 0%, what you have to do is either comment the line out which is, or just remove the line. So just something to be, take note of. Um, what we like about this kind of configuration is if, uh, say for instance, we have a, an app team that, that wants 10% of their traffic and then they shift it to 50%, and you're, during deployment, you're all good, everybody's happy, everybody goes home, and then uh, over the next couple of days, you're actually making more configuration changes and uh, for maybe other different uh, microservices teams or, or whatever, and then the original app team comes back and says, hey, we need to roll back. We, we have a problem that we didn't recognize on deployment night. So instead of having to actually roll back the code, we can roll forward by just changing our changing our um, app upstream to 0%, and all of a sudden we're back to the data center for all of the traffic, okay? The last thing I kind of want to talk about is this, this concept of reacting to application errors. And I'm going to talk about two different types of errors, and some of them are pretty straightforward, but uh, hard errors and soft errors. And what I mean by hard errors is pretty obvious. It's your 500 and your 400 level errors that are clearly application misconfigurations or failures. Okay? The soft errors, on the other hand, are those, kind of those application errors that that require the request to be reprocessed, okay? We'll generally do soft errors in, in HTTP land. You'll generally do soft errors with a redirect, a 301, 302, 307, something in there. But I'm gonna actually show you some other uh, ways we can do that, which are actually pretty interesting. So let's talk about hard errors first. Why, we do, why do we care about having our proxy look after hard errors? Um, the first is we get a unified error page for our errors. And, it's, it's important that our customers always get a good error page. And if you've got a, a lot of microservices out there in the cloud, uh, you don't want to have to have all of your microservices have some code in them that deals with the, the display of a, of a pretty error. That gets more, even more complicated when you're dealing with multilingual sites and you're having to deal with, um, you know, now all of a sudden you have, instead of just this very simple error page, you have to have, you know, 20 different error pages because you have different, 20 different languages you have to deal with. Uh, a couple things that are really nice about this is our apps can, can all of a sudden go back to a, a process of just responding with a 400 or a, a 500 level error if it actually ha if it truly is a 500 error. We can get it logged properly in the, the application. We can get it logged properly within our, our proxy. 
um, but we can still make sure that we're sending the proper, a nice error page back to the customer. Uh, the other thing is, uh, with 500 errors, if, if, because we know that the proxy is going to be responding with a nice error page, we can be sure, we're going to let our app teams like send stack traces out on those errors. And we just know that they're not going to, have, they're not going to propagate out to the customer. And that also gives you some debugging options if you have to, um, if you are getting a 500 error and you have a stack trace, you can, you can bypass your proxy in a, in a temporary way just as you're debugging the problem, right? And you actually get the stack trace. Uh, the other thing, and I, I, I don't know how much I can stress this, but the application developers just don't even have to worry about errors, right? They just do what they do. They get to do the things that they are paid to do. They don't have to worry about the errors and making sure that everything looks right. Let's make sure we do that at the proxy level, okay? From a soft errors perspective, what I'm talking about here is uh, like situations where the request, um, you could have made a decision where you, um, you didn't want the request to go to the app, so you added a whole bunch of configuration into your Nginx config so that when, let's say, for instance, a particular query string is there, um, you don't send the app to the, or the request to the, the cloud, but you send it back to your data center because your data center, you know you can handle it. But what you get in those kinds of situations, especially if you have lots of those, is you get this tightly coupled system between Nginx and your, your services. And we all know we should probably be trying to architect for fairly decoupled systems. So uh, that's kind of what we're talking about. The, a good example we had with Expedia was we had this, um, we needed to move our, our hotel search page from an old URL pattern, which included a whole old URL patterns of their query strings, to a new URL pattern that was a completely different set of query strings. So what we ended up doing was we built a microservice that could just do that translation. Okay? But there were certain things, and because hotel searches are actually quite complicated for various things, um, there were certain features of, a ho of the hotel search that we couldn't easily translate. So what we did was we instead, we just said all of the traffic for the old pattern is going to go to this microservice. And when the microservice itself can't do the response, we'll have the microservice send a, an error back to, the, back to the customer. And we'll do that with a 302 or a 307. That's how we originally implemented this. It's usually handled with the, the redirect. And normally what you can do is you add like a, a query string parameter like no cloud or no app or something like that. And then you key off of that within your Nginx config. And when, you see, when Nginx sees that, that, ver that query string parameter, you can just short circuit all of your routing and route it all the way to, back to the data center. So that's kind of one approach that we can take. But there's a different one as well, which I'm about to talk about. Um, the other thing that we can do with this, and it kind of in my example kind of talks about that, is this feature parity. So maybe as you're migrating your applications to the cloud, you, you don't want to, you want to get it out there, right? You want, maybe you want to build 80% of the features, but um, the last 20% you're going to build over time. This is where you could use this kind of um, soft error approach as well. So just talking about this again through a diagram, um, what we're talking about here, this is, the three, this is what it would look like if we were doing it with the 302. Um, your request would come in for slash my app. The Nginx proxy is going to route it to your cloud. Uh, the cloud app, for some reason, can't handle the request, so it responds with a 302. And the location in that 302 header is the same request, but with a question mark, no app equals one. That goes all the way back to the browser. The browser re-requests the new page. Nginx proxy grabs it, says, oh, that's got a no app equals one on it, so I'm going to route it to the data center. Okay? That's one approach to it, but I'd actually present there's a slightly different, a better approach to this. And that is this, where we react to soft errors within the proxy itself. So what happens is the browser is still going to make that initial request. Initial request is going to go to the app. But then instead of the app responding with a 302, we have the app respond with a special error code. And what we do at Expedia is we've used a non-standard HTTP error code. And that's what I'll, I'm about to show you in the configuration. Um, and what we'll do with this is the proxy is going to use its error handling system to re-request the exact same request, but back to the data center. So we get the same result back to the customer, but instead of the, the entire um, 
the browser having to do all of the 302 and 307 or all of that work and you have to deal, if you're dealing with CDNs, especially if you're uh, across the world, maybe you're dealing with latency, you can actually reduce all of that by, by not having the request go all the way back to the browser. So the configuration for this looks kind of like this. Okay? What we do is we're just going to use Nginx's error handling. It's the error page is for a 352. That's our non-standard error code. And when that happens, we're going to send it to our location defined by at 352 retry. And then on a 404, we're going to do it. We're going to send it to our 404 fallback. We have the proxy intercept errors turned on. Without proxy intercept errors, none of this works. All of this error handling just doesn't even happen in a proxied request. Um, and then the actual location blocks are pretty straightforward as well. So what we get is, uh, and I, I realize I don't, I don't actually use the set original error code in there, but I've got it in there so I talk about one additional piece of, piece of thing that I, I just I really feel is important, and that's logging your original error code. It's actually, especially on like a 404 or even the 352 is fine. Um, Nginx, when it makes the request, back to the secondary request to, for your error handler, it's going to respond, and the, the response that you get from the error handler is actually going to be what's logged. So if you don't log your original error code, you're going to lose what the original uh, request, what was going on with the original request. There's lots of other things you could do here as well with your original error code if you want, or original, uh, you know, you grab a bit of, you know, if there's some headers or something that you wanted to grab, you could also log those. The proxy pass line is pretty straightforward. We're going to route to our data center upstream, and then we're going to use the dollar sign URI variable, which is just our, our U, the original request URI. We're going to use dollar sign is args, which will give us a question mark if there were arguments, and, it, and it'll be blank if there are not arguments, and then we'll use dollar sign args for the actual arguments that were on the query string. Uh, 404 fallback works actually really similar. It's just we're going to log the 404 and then um, we're going to route it to the 404 error page. So that really kind of, I'm actually going really fast based on the time, but um, kind of really f um, wraps up what we, were, what we were trying to do. We really wanted that multi-region resiliency just to make sure that when, when something goes on with an app, it's far better for us to route that traffic to a different region and get a latent response than to get a response that's bad. So that's really what that that's what that pillar was all about. The software or the uh, the the split clients and uh, avoiding that knife edge is so important when you're dealing with microservices, just so that you can make sure that, um, uh, especially on traffic where it's a request that's already there, um, it's so important that you don't just flip it over. It, we we've seen it countless times where if you just flip it over, it's gonna you're gonna you're gonna break something, and you just want to avoid that. And then this this whole idea of soft and hard errors um, really is just using the nginx config to its its uh, its potential. So um, I do have one other thing. I, I I wasn't sure how long this was gonna take. I've run it through a few times, and it's taken me various amounts of time. And I have enough time that I'm going to talk about one other thing. So let me figure out how to jump my thank you slide and go to my last slide, uh, my backup slide. And this is, this is something that we do at Expedia that we really like. And it's just this configuration of let's log where we sent the traffic. Now, I know Nginx actually logs the IP. You can have it so it logs the IP of the upstream of where it sent the traffic. But I don't know if you're like me. I don't know the IPs of all of my upstreams especially when I'm dealing with you know, 130, 140 different microservices across the network. Um, so what we have is this. This isn't actually technically logging, but what we have is the ability for um, an engineer, uh, anyone actually, to uh, make a request. And when they make a request and they add a special header to the request, we have Nginx respond with extra information about where it sent the traffic. What this does for us is two things it does for us. It, it, it totally, like we get so many emails on my team asking what's wrong. And you know, our Nginx servers are sending 500 errors. You need to fix it. And what we can do very easily is we can just 
hit the, hit the same the URL that they're complaining about, add their special header, and we get a back saying, no, Nginx is fine. We sent the traffic over to you, and you responded with a 500, so you have to figure out what's going on. Um, the thing about this configuration that I like is that it doesn't happen all the time. It only happens when we send the special header. And we do this because we don't really feel like it's a great security model to be sending out in a header for every request where we sent the traffic. Okay? So what we're doing here is, is kind of interesting. Uh, the other thing I want to mention, and the reason that first map is there, is we actually have multiple Nginx proxies. We actually have an Nginx proxy that sits in our data center, and then we have an Nginx proxy that sits in our, in our cloud. So both of these two systems can do this same uh, respond with this header that tells us where it sent it. And what we needed to be able to do is have it so I wanted one header that was in the response. So that's what that map at the top is doing. It's taking the what we call route taken, um, and then a comma, and then whatever it got as the, uh, as the X route in the upstream from the response. Okay? And then it's taking that information, and it's basically just applying it to a variable called T route, which is then added into dollar sign X route. It's a little bit funky configuration. There's a little crazy regex there that um, is using a named um, a name capture group, which you can also do. Uh, um, but it does work. And then what we do is in, in the location block for our, for our data center, for example, we set the route taken to our data center variable, or our data center upstream. Okay. So what happens is if you think about this from a um, from a header perspective is what you get is one header that kind of looks like an X forwarded four, but it's kind of in reverse, right? We're saying, not saying what, what, what IP did we, we're, we're adding the IPs of all of the servers that touch the request. We're adding the re, where we sent the request um, in a reverse order. So the very first one is going to be the last, the first thing that touched it. And then um, the next, the, the last thing that touched it is going to be at the end. Okay, and then all we're doing here is if the that if condition right there in the location. I know it's not good to put an if in a location block like that, but it does okay. Um, uh, what we're saying there is if the show route does not equal true, then we're going to turn that. We're just going to take that variable and reset it back to nothing. Okay, so everything that we did up in that map just gets blown away. And then we use more set headers instead of just the, the add header directive here, because more set headers will actually replace the existing header, uh, where um, add headers will add a header. So you'll end up getting two headers, which is not really what you want. Um, and then we just set the, the value. And then the proxy pass is pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, the other thing I really like about this is this, this single feature has been able to give us the ability to have fully automated testing for all of our routing for Nginx. Because what we can do is in our own entire inf test infrastructure, we can turn on all the requests so that they have this header. And we can then look and inspect the response headers to make sure that they're, they're going the right direction. Okay? So that's pretty much it. Um, I, I guess I'll open it up to questions. Uh, we've got a little bit of time, so. Nothing? OK. Oh, right over here. He's getting a mic. He's getting a mic for you. Uh, so the, the question is, uh, within the data center, are you, what sort of health checks are you guys doing? Uh, so when you're doing the, the in data center redirects, uh, when you're doing, I think it was the 352 errors that you guys yeah. were throwing, uh, what are you doing to ensure that that's not getting shunted to yet another box and you have that's already overloaded or unable to uh, uh, meet that request? So the 352, because of the fact that um, I think the configuration is actually slightly different in our in our production environment, but we end up getting um, we end up basically turning the proxy intercept errors off for the re-request, so you don't actually get this system of servers constantly just the 352 just sitting there constantly getting re-requested. It's going to happen once basically, and then it just stops work. It stops happening. So does that answer your question?
Okay. I One more say, question. Oh, Come on. You, <laughs> you don't need to. It's all good. That means I was perfectly clear. It's clear as mud. This is awesome. So when you um, experience a failure condition in your cloud deployment, you throw a 352 and have it re-request, do you at some point um, you know, infer that this route you know, will always error out and you cache the route to have it you know, go straight to the data center each time instead of having that failure first? Um, so really, the, the 352 is no. To answer your question is no. We, we just don't, like, we probably could come up with a, a pretty complicated way of caching that so that it, caching the result and saying, yes, that should always go to the data center. Um, but we just haven't found the need. Like, it's normally the, uh, the microservice is close enough to your internet cluster that you're not dealing with latency. And that thing, normally they're written so that they can, they can short circuit themselves pretty fast. So you're just not, you're just not dealing with it. We just haven't had the value of having to do that. So does that answer? Okay, I think I'm done. All right, thank you guys.